So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us for this webinar today on pain management and gabapentin. I'm Krista Berquist. I'm the Program Advisor for Saskatchewan with CADIS. Um, as I'm currently joining you today from Regina, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the land in which we gather is Treaty 4 and Treaty 6 territory and the traditional territory of the Cree and Soto, Assiniboine, and Métis. So today we're presenting this webinar with support from our colleagues with Continuing Education and Development from the University of Saskatchewan College of Nursing and Saskatoon. Today's topic is pain management and gabapentin and will be presented by Colleen Donder with CADIS and Dr. Will Khalil. First presenting will be Colleen Donder. We are fortunate to have Colleen join our CADIS team as a knowledge mobilization officer in October of 2018. She is a pharmacist by trade and graduated from Dalhousie University with her Bachelor of Pharmacy degree. Prior to joining CADIS, she completed a hospital pharmacy residency and worked as an academic detailing and clinical hospital pharmacist. Following, Dr. Khalil will present. Dr. Khalil completed his specialty training in physical medicine and rehab at the University of Saskatchewan. He furthered his training in pain, spine, and sport medicine in Edmonton, and currently is certified as a specialist with the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada. He serves as an assistant professor with the College of Medicine, where he is involved in teaching medical students and residents. We will be taking questions at the end of this presentation, so please uh, type your questions in the chat box throughout the presentation, and we'll do our best to address those near the end of the session. For those who are not able to attend today, this session will be recorded and will be made available for viewing afterwards. I hope you all enjoy this session, and with that, I will hand it over to Colleen. Thank you, Krista, for the kind introduction. Um, I would also like to begin by acknowledging that I am based in Winnipeg, which is in Treaty 1 territory, and the land on which I am positioned is the traditional territory of the Ashinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. Uh, next slide, please. Um, just to uh, cover disclosures from CADIS, um, CADIS is funded by federal, provincial, and territorial ministries of health, and we also have application fees for three of our different programs. Next slide. Uh, but we do not have any uh, relationships with any industry and have no other conflicts of interest to disclose. Next slide, please. I would like just to take a moment just to acknowledge everyone who had a role in making today's webinar possible. Um, so I also would like to acknowledge Jose um, who organized this webinar. I forgot to mention her name on the slide. Uh, but everyone there um, had a role in bringing this to you. So thank you to everybody. Next slide, please. Uh, so just a little bit about CADIS before we get started. Um, CADIS is an independent non-for-profit organization and essentially what we do is help bring evidence to decision makers to help with the optimal use of drugs and medical devices. Next slide. At the end of the presentation, I will um, cover um, how we may, how CADIS may be able to help you in the future, but we can help with evidence and analysis and recommendations and things like that. Next slide, please. So for our learning objectives today, you may be aware of what the learning objectives were from the poster that was circulated with the registration link, um, but I'm going to be discussing the evidence for the gabapentinoids and their role in chronic pain management, and my co-presenter, Dr. Khalil, will be covering uh, the other various objectives. Next slide, please. Uh, so just to orient you um, a little bit to the CADIS website in case you're interested in more information uh, from CADIS, uh, if you go to cadis.ca um, and click on resources at the top, uh, you'll have a list of resources where you can click on evidence bundles, and then uh, from evidence bundles, you'll see a list of our different evidence bundles that are available. And we do have one on pain management. So in these bundles, we summarize um, all the reports that we've done um, are all linked from this bundle just to make it easy to find and navigate our website to find what you're looking for. And we have evidence bundles on uh, different other uh, conditions um, and devices and things like that, if that is of interest to you. Next slide, please. So today I'm going to be discussing a few different CADIS rapid responses. Uh, so these are reviews where we looked at the evidence um, and summarized and critically appraised the evidence. Uh, and so mainly about gabapentin, but I will uh, briefly chat about some Cochrane reviews and pregabalin near the end. Next slide, please. 
So uh, starting with our 2015 CADIC uh, report, what we were looking for was the efficacy of gabapentin versus placebo. Um, and did it work for, does it work for neuropathic pain? Uh, and so we found a bunch of different systematic reviews and randomized control trials. And essentially what was found was that there was reduction, a greater reduction in pain with gabapentin for diabetic peripheral neuropathy and post-herpetic neuralgia. Next slide, please. And for, um, for the specific numbers for, for the gabapentin, um, if you look at the fourth column there, it says patients with substantial benefits. And so that substantial benefit is reported as a 50% reduction in pain. And so you can see that gabapentin uh, demonstrated a substantial reduction in pain. And when we look at the numbers needed to treat there, um, we have for diabetic peripheral neuropathy, a number needed to treat of around six, and for post-herpetic neuralgia, a number needed to treat of seven. So if you do look at our CADIS review from 2015, you will see that that post-herpetic neuralgia number is actually reported as, an, as a number needed to treat of eight. Um, that why it is updated on this slide is that there is a new Cochrane review and it identified one additional a randomized control trial that impacted the results um, of the number needed to treat. Um, but in that uh, same Cochrane review, they did not identify any new information on diabetic peripheral neuropathy. So the numbers stayed the same in the updated Cochrane review. Uh, so these are the most recent numbers being shown here from that Cochrane review. So uh, next slide, please. So just to put this into perspective, so what does this mean for a patient? What does this mean um, when you say a number needed to treat of six? How is this applicable to me in my practice? So for gabapentin um, being shown to reduce pain by about 50% for patients uh, with a number needed to treat of six means if we take six people with diabetic peripheral neuropathy and we give them gabapentin, one person out of those six people represented by the green happy face will receive a 50% or greater reduction in pain. What, uh, what it does, what for those other five individuals, they will not have reached that 50% reduction in pain, but they could have fallen anywhere on that scale. So they may have had a 30% reduction in pain. They may have had no reduction in pain. Uh, we can't predict where they would land on that scale. And so it is very important when we're treating something like neuropathic pain, we're able to monitor and we're able to follow up and see, is this person someone who's getting a benefit from this medication? Are they that green happy face getting that 50% reduction? If not, um, are they getting any kind of reduction at all? Are they maybe getting a 30% reduction and that actually is meaningful to them because now they're able to do something that they weren't able to do before? Or maybe are they someone who's not getting any benefit at all and we wanna stop this medication? Or maybe they're getting a lot of side effects and maybe this medication is not worth it for them to be taking. So there is lots of things to consider. So when we say that, yeah, gabapentin has shown to be effective for, neuro, for diabetic neuropathic pain and for post-herpetic neuralgia, it does not mean that every single person will see benefit. And so that's why monitoring and follow-up is so important because we don't wanna continue something if it's not helping the, the person. Um, and so it's all, all about a conversation with them. Are you having a meaningful change? Do you wanna keep taking this medication? Is it helping you? When we use medications to prevent something, we never know if we're like trying to use a medication, for example, to prevent a heart attack. We don't know if we are if we prevented it for that person or if we are going to prevent it. But when it comes to something like pain, we do know if we're making a difference. So it's so important to be having those conversations with people to make sure that they are receiving benefit from that medication. Next slide, please. So um, as I mentioned, I mentioned side effects when I was uh, just talking on the previous slide. And there are lots of side effects with medication. So I just wanted to highlight a few of the side effects for gabapentin um, that, that are very common. So somnolence, dizziness, peripheral edema, and gait disturbances are some of the side effects that have come out in, in our review of the literature. 
And there are lots of other ones. There's even other kind of serious but rare ones. I'm not going to dive into all the details today. But again, when we're following up with someone to see if they're having um, efficacy or they're having effectiveness from that medication, seeing that pain reduction, we also want to be talking about side effects. And also thinking in our practice, we see something like peripheral edema. A lot of the time we start thinking, oh, we need to add furosemide and maybe they have some heart failure, maybe something's going on. But we also need to think about, was there a medication or are they on a medication that could be causing this side effect? So something that's very important to also think about when we, when we see these different side effects and also important to be talking with our patients to see uh, how they're feeling, uh, how are the side effects, and how do those side effects compare to the efficacy that they're, that they're seeing with the medication. Next slide, please. So uh, you may be thinking right now, okay, you talked about diabetic peripheral neuropathy and you talked about post neuralgia, but there are lots of other types of neuropathic pain. How does gabapentin, does gabapentin work for any other types of neuropathic pain? And really, it's a big question mark. We don't know whether gabapentin is effective for a lot of the other neuropathic pain conditions. We have many listed on the, on the slide here, like fibromyalgia and chronic low back pain. So there is uncertainty. We don't have strong evidence to say if it does or does not work. So it's that big kind of question mark still for a lot of the other different types of neuropathic pain conditions. Next slide, please. Uh, from So what I just mentioned was actually from a 2018 CADF review um, where we looked at the updated evidence there for those uh, various neuropathic pain conditions. For the 2014 uh, review that we have, we looked at gabapentin versus um, other types of medications that are used for neuropathic pain, such as the tricyclic antidepressants, also, uh, for example, amitriptyline the serotonin, norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors such as duloxetine uh, and pregabalin. Uh, and essentially what was found in our review was that they're considered to be um, comparatively effective, but the evidence um, isn't that great for, di for direct comparison. A lot of the time it's indirect evidence kind of making extrapolations. Um, next slide, please. But kind of based on that evidence and kind of based on guidelines, um, it kind of has shown that, well, any of these options are, one, any of these medications are options for neuropathic pain. So the NICE guidelines in the UK, they say gabapentin is one of the first line options, but you can also consider some of the other ones like the amit amitriptyline, duloxetine, pregabalin as also available options for using to treat this condition, these conditions. Um, and then in the US, they say, yep, gabapentin is an option for diabetic neuropathy. Uh, and we also have a Canadian consensus statement. Uh, it was actually released right after we published our CADIS report that included information on guidelines. So it's not reflected in that CADIS report if you do go look there. Um, but we do have a Canadian consensus statement. And it essentially is along the same lines as the NICE guidelines, which says uh, uh, any of these medications are kind of options first line and to think about side effects and the patient that you're prescribing and cost and, and things like that when making a decision for neuropathic pain. Next slide, please. So transitioning right along uh, into the evidence for pregabalin. Uh, so unfortunately, we do not have any recent CADIS reports, uh, but there are some recent Cochrane reviews out on pregabalin. And at CADIS, we try to go for high, the highest level of evidence. Uh, and so we normally identify Cochrane reviews as being of, of high level when we are doing our reports. So I thought I would just quickly mention just to show how pregabalin um, compares also to gabapentin. So again, the same kind of marker was being used here, that 50% reduction in pain being the, being the outcome here. And pregabalin showed effectiveness for diabetic peripheral neuropathy and post neuralgia, so that aligns with gabapentin. But it also does have evidence to support its use for mixed or unclassified post-traumatic neuropathic pain and also for fibromyalgia. Next slide, please. And again, where the big question marks exist 
are for uh, uh, for a lot of the other neuropathic conditions that weren't mentioned. So the chronic back pain, the, the sciatica, the central neuropathic pain. Um, so there, there are still some big question marks with, with pregabalin as well. Next slide, please. And side effects, they're very comparable and similar to gabapentin. Did want to highlight that waking came out as one of the more common ones with pergabalin that didn't come out with the, with the gabapentin, but essentially a, a similar side effect profile. But there, there are even more side effects, like I said, uh, with, the gab, with gabapentin and pergabalin that I'm not listing here. This is just the real common ones that were identified in, in the evidence reviews. Next slide, please. So I wanted to provide a summary slide just to just to kind of lay everything out that I just said, because I know I covered a lot of information very quickly. Um, but just so that you're aware, gabapentin and pregabalin both have shown effectiveness in diabetic peripheral neuropathy and post-herpetic neuralgia. And I didn't get into the specifics about pregabalin, but if numbers needed to treat around the same, they're around a five to six uh, for those conditions where the gabapentin was a six and a seven. Um, and then pregabalin also showed effectiveness in fibromyalgia and also for mixed or unclassified post-traumatic neuropathic pain. The numbers needed to treat for those are a bit higher, a seven for the mixed and a number needed to treat of 10 for fibromyalgia. So um, just being aware that with those numbers um, and just kind of reflecting that not every single person is going to get a meaningful benefit from these medications. So the reassessment piece, following up, making sure they're getting a benefit because all we have to do is ask them and see if, if, if they want to continue taking the medication and to think about side effects. Um, and I just wanted to also highlight here that there are still some big question marks where we're not really sure the role of these medications. Uh, and pregabalin for HIV neuropathy actually has shown not to be effective uh, for treating HIV neuropathy. Next slide, please. So my last little piece that I wanted to say before I transition over to Dr. Cleal uh, was just a little bit about abuse uh, potential for gabapentin and pregabalin. So we have two CADIC reports out, one on pregabalin misuse and one on gabapentin misuse. And essentially, these medications can be misused. Pregabalin is actually a controlled substance in the US, uh, and the UK are actually transitioning both pregabalin and gabapentin over to controlled substances. Um, so they would follow along the same lines as, as narcotics in that, in that jurisdiction. Um, and so just so you're aware that these medications have been shown that they can potentially have a euphoric effect. Um, they have been used recreationally. We don't really know if we have someone who has neuropathic pain who does not have a history of misuse and we start them on this, these medications. We don't know if they're at risk of misusing or develop or are potentially using recreational using it recreationally. Um, but what we do know is that when people have a history of abuse, they are at increased risk of abusing these medications. So it's just something uh, something to be aware and something that you might hear about. Uh, in the news. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just the last little piece uh, that I mentioned at the beginning, just how can how, how can CADIS help you? Um, but essentially, we review evidence to help with, with help support you in your practice, whether that's creating patient information materials or helping with policies and things like that. So feel free to reach out. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and the emails there, this will also be at the end of the presentation, um, if you would like. So thank you so much for listening. Uh, sorry if I went too quick, um, but essentially, like I mentioned, the take home message really is that some people will get benefits and just to really monitor to make sure that the person that you are dealing with is getting the benefits. And if not, we do have other options to try to help them and not to continue medications if they're not helping the individual. Uh, so uh, you can forward on to Dr. Khalil's portion of the presentation. Thank you. Keep moving along. I think there's a couple slides there. There we go. Thank you. Thank you, Colleen. That was excellent. I really appreciate that talk and I'm very delighted to be invited on behalf of Kadith and to give the talk today. Um, basically, providing a clinical expertise on 
gabapentinoids and how it's used in a clinical atmosphere in general by physicians. So with that said, I don't know, is my slides up? Yes. So if we can go to the next slide there. So just disclosures here, and I have no real disclosures or relationship with uh, conflicts of interest or commercial interests. Next slide. Again, acknowledging Kadith uh, for putting this together, as well as Sask Pain Society and Suzanne Tupper for really bringing this all together. Next slide, please. So objectives today, I'll just cover over the objectives real quick. I really wanted to get into, like I mentioned, the clinical perspective of how physicians may be using gabapentinoids and talk a little bit about chronic pain in general and explain pain. So what I wanted to do is talk about the common terminology and semantics matters, but we'll talk about the terminology, how pain is used and some of the pathways in that are involved in pain in general. I'll also get into the mechanism of action for gabapentinoids in general and how it's utilized in chronic pain. And then we'll talk about the clinical indications, when to prescribe gabapentinoids, some of the practice patterns you'll see out there and some of the unusual potentially practice patterns you'll see out there. And I will try to talk on the precautions for you or monitoring principles for gabapentinoids, but if there's any redundancy in the slides, I might just go by or brush off real quick. So if you go on to the next slide, please there. So in general, when we're talking about pain as a definition, it's described as an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage described or described in terms of such damage. So next slide. Sorry, I'm getting a bit of a delay here. So with chronic pain as a definition, so after understanding the, the, the actual definition of pain in general, but chronic pain, and you'll see this described differently in the literature out there, but in general, uh, this group here uh, from the IASP put together that pain is, chronic pain is considered pain that is ongoing, usually lasting longer than six months. This type of pain can continue after an injury or illness that is caused or healed or gone away in general. Pain signals, what will end up happening is it remains active in the nervous system for weeks, months, or even some patients will notice for years. Some people suffer chronic pain even when there is no past injury or apparent body damage, which is interesting. Or otherwise, chronic non-cancer pain includes any painful condition that persists for at least three months and is not associated with malignant diseases. Another way to define chronic pain, but you will see literature out there that will describe acute pain as any time after the pain has happened up to a month. Subacute pain, you'll also notice that it'll be described from a month up to three months. And like I mentioned, other literature will describe chronic pain at three months onwards. So really what we're trying to do is get into or breaking the pain cycle before it turns to chronic pain. And it's a little fuzzy when we're describing when or how chronic pain is actually defined, but three to six months is that time zone. For clinicians, I think that's where it's key to kind of intervene. Next slide. Next slide, please, sorry. Hello? Yeah, it, it's showing on the pain pathway slide, Dr. Khalil. Do you have a delay maybe? Okay. Hello, are you there? Oh, it must have dropped the call. I guess I'll just hold tight, everybody. Sorry for the technical problems. We'll hold tight and hopefully he can call back in right away.
I don't see any questions in the chat box right now, but I suppose while we're waiting for Dr. Quill to join us again, um, if there are any questions, feel free to, um, from Colleen's presentation, feel free to um, type those into the chat box and we'll do our best to answer those right now while we have a couple minutes. So there is one question, uh, Colleen, perhaps you can answer it. It asks, how long should you continue gabapentin or pregabalin before switching it if it's not making a difference? I will defer to Dr. Khalil. Um, I'll see if he has any from his uh, clinical practice, if he has any advice uh, on, on that for monitoring. I do know different groups out there say that you should be able to see some kind of improvement within the first four weeks, um, but I will defer to him to see if he has any uh, insight based on his practice. Sorry, but I just keep you posted. Dr. Quill is is trying to rejoin us. It's um, hello. Oh, we can hear you again, Dr. Quill. Okay, perfect. Sorry, I'm using my phone. I'm not sure what happened. I think the audio from the computer went out, and there is some delay with the slides. Okay, can everyone hear me? Okay. Yes, we can hear great. you great now. Perfect. So if we can go just back to the slide on neuropathic versus nociceptive to continue with the definition. Sorry about that. Technical difficulties has always been my main issue. Sorry, this is, hello? Yeah, we have you. Okay, perfect. I'll just continue on. Uh, please text in that text box if it cuts out again. So with neuroceptive pain versus nociceptive pain, neuropathic or sorry, neuropathic pain versus nociceptive, we usually describe neuropathic, and it's interesting because all pain generally finds its way into the central nervous system in general. And so neuropathic pain results from damage or pathology within the nervous system. So usually we describe it as central or peripheral. Causes of neuropathic Pain are usually multiple, includes diabetes, post neuralgia, stroke, but anything that's found its way into the central nervous system. Whereas nociceptive pain, in contrast, we, we consider the stimulus or actual tissue damage. So if you'd like to think of it as more musculoskeletal in nature, um, where there's inflammation or mechanical disruption of tissue, um, rheumatological problems would also be considered nociceptive pain. But when you really think about it, the pain is coming back into the central nervous system as it's finding its way into the ascending pathways. If you go to the next slide, please. And so this is a very simplistic kind of pain pathway, which we were taught back in uh, medical school. And uh, it's basically the pathways of how pain exists. You have different nerve fibers and the main ones, and it's been theorized that over the last hundred years, there's about six to nine different pain theories and somehow they make their way through these nerve fibers. And there's a primary, secondary, third order, until it gets its way up to the neuroanatomical structure of the thalamus, then will find its way into the cortex. And for some reason along these pathways, we're not quite sure what's going on in the nerves, if it's gates, if it's channels, if something is disrupted and all of a sudden a, a signal is sent back to the patient and a patient is then understanding that they have pain or 
there is a reception or sensation of pain. So if we go to the next slide there, and it's unfortunate because as physicians, pain is so subjective. All we really have to fall on, it's not like your rheumatologist where you can, you know, test for a marker for CRP or ESR and just see if their inflammatory markers are up. It's very subjective. And what we really report are pain scales, usually put on visual analog scales. And so this is pain pathways, this targets here. It's just in the boxes, if you pay attention the boxes are where some of the mechanism of actions of where some of these medications will work. And again, this is one of the nerve terminal endings and it's showing you that there's multiple channels with a multitude of interneuron uh, pathways that eventually will make its way into the central nervous system to send that signal of pain and be perceived as pain. And really, next slide, please. When a patient comes into your office, it's not as simple as just the pain that's the, the event or injury that's causing the pain. We really got to take into account that these patients are not just coming in with their injury, but total pain. And I like to put this because it shows that overlap. The total pain is the pain and suffering. They're, like I mentioned, there's that neuropathic, nociceptive component, but they're also coming in. They have social issues. They have family problems. Their physical disability has not allowed them to go to work. They're not able to socially interact, go out. They, they, this might be causing constraints on paying their bills, their mortgage, uh, relationships with their families. And what we really end up seeing is when they come into your clinic is a patient that comes in with an overall picture of pain and we try our best to focus on pain generators. But again, like I mentioned, with the neuroanatomy and the pain receptors, it's not as simple as we think it is. And so next slide, please. With gabapentinoids in general, with the mechanism of action, what I want to point out is how it works. And with gabapentinoids, in general, gabapentin, and I, I do speak a little bit about the difference between uh, gabapentin and uh, pregabal in Lyrica, but how they work is it binds to the alpha-2 delta subunits of your voltage-gated calcium channel within that uh, central nervous system. And what that does is it modulates calcium influx into the nerve terminal. So this is just one of those theories where they believe that modulating calcium might be able to slow things down, this inhibitory, excitatory, transmission into the central nervous system. And uh, the story goes uh, that initially gabapentin, if you look at the historical, the way it was uh, studied was uh, founded uh, by Japanese uh, researchers uh, where in the 50s or 60s, I believe, they were looking for an adjunct therapy to treat seizures. And uh, they eventually found that basically would work by slowing down these calcium channel gates and basically slowing down the excitatory transmission to prevent seizures from occurring. But it wasn't even as good as other um, adjunct therapies for seizures. But eventually, I think in the early 90s, Pfizer had picked it up and were thinking, okay, well, why don't we run with the theory of inhibiting basically providing inhibitory ex, uh, excita excitation to the central nervous system where we can slow down neurotransmitters and potentially this may be able to be used in the context of pain. And so we have a shade reaction of uh, studies that look into the gabapentinoids and all uh, the different ways they can interact and slow pain down. But again, what I wanted to mention Next slide here, um, and this is a bit redundant for from our last study, but what I want to mention is you have to take all these studies with a grain of salt. Basically, what they are mostly doing are presenting, like Colleen had mentioned, it's they're looking at visual analog scales and they're looking at overall pain intensity reduction. And after treating pain, with my experience with treating pain, I have now come to a conclusion where patients who have chronic pain, I'm not really telling them that I have a magic wand and I may be able to eliminate their pain. But what I'm doing is it's like a stereo system. And what we're trying to do is turn down the volume of pain. And these studies, I feel if they were 
to look at the primary outcomes of just visual analog scales of pain intensity reduction. If they also looked at secondary outcomes, things like are they more functional? Are they uh, able to return to work? Are they having better sleep? Are they more social? This is where some of these studies would shine and show reason for why they have actual benefit. And so although the numbers needed to treat, if you go to the next slide, are not as impressive and we can't really draw conclusions and that's for pregabalin, which are similar, we can't really draw conclusions, but what we want to do is look at the overall picture. Are we reducing some pain and that's considered 50% pain intensity reduction, but are we also able to make them more functional? And so when I'm seeing patients, I'm always asking, well, how much more can we do? How much have we reduced your pain? Yes, but tell me about what benefit have you had from this medication? And that's where I'll talk a little bit about how to um, dose these medications and how to titrate them as well. So next slide, please. So this is a summary slide here. And when you're looking at the studies to see what they've actually shown some or reach close to statistical significance, but we're obviously combing out all the studies that were poorly powered or did not reach statistical significance, you do have some approval for neuropathic pain and that's considered neuropathies or post-herpatic neuralgia. Seizures, like I mentioned, as an adjunct for gabapentin, we also use it with spinal cord injury associated neuropathic pain, but this again, did not uh, was not powered great. You have very low ends and so they're not really included in the bigger picture when we're starting to talk about gabapentinoids in the context of pain. And so what you'll see is, off-label use, just based on running on the theory and understanding how complex the neuroanatomy of nerves is with pain in general, it has been used off-label for complex regional pain. We use it in the world of physical medicine for spasticity. You'll also see psychiatrists use it for general anxiety, anxiety disorder, which uh, as well as alcohol disorder and alcohol withdrawal. Um, some physicians out there will actually transition patients when they're trying to take them off opioids and have been bridging patients with gabapentin, which tells you that they're almost working in very similar mechanisms of action, but not really understood. Fibromyalgia, I might talk a little bit about, but again, uh, the list goes on and on there. So chronic puritis, restless leg syndrome, and a poorly studied, but low power, low numbers, and not really brought up. But again, you will be uh, noticing that some of these patients uh, are using these medications. Next slide, please. And pregabalin there is same redundant list. Next slide. So I think in uh, uh, the FDA um, in the United States in 2007, we were able to get approval as first line for fibromyalgia, which is interesting if you go back to the study, this is where they actually look at um, how the medication, when they're not just looking at pain intensity reduction, but really when they're focusing on sleep fatigue and making a patient more functional, and uh, they were able to get FDA, FDA approval for the use of Lyrica. Again, um, some will ask about Lyrica or pregabalin, sorry, versus gabapentin. And it's just basically a, a depending on who funded the study and if it was studied or not. Next slide. So physicians, we usually, and I don't know how well this is showing up on your slides there, but we like to fall on a, a on something guidelines. And these guidelines basically provide us with some kind of uh, way to treat patients with pain. As I mentioned, it's very complex. We're not sure how these medications are working. There's not really strong evidence to show that they're that beneficial. And so when patients are coming in with chronic pain, we wanna have first line, second line, third line agents so that we're within the norms of our practice pattern for our colleagues and focusing on evidence-based medicine, yes, but uh, something that does show studies were studied. And so these uh, guidelines are basically consensus statements where experts sit down on a panel, look at the studies and say, okay, 
yes, some of these studies are not that great, but uh, we believe that this is what we should be using. And they come out with statements and every country is slightly different. So this is your uh, guidelines for the Americans, which I stole from up to date. But what I, wanna know, what I want you to notice there is that the non-pharmacological approach so right after your neuropathic pain, your non-pharmacological, pharmacological, and then a specific diagnosis. So any patient who comes into my office who is looking for some form of optimization to their pain management, I always focus on the non-pharmacological approach and mention have these patients, uh, we, we really need to look at strategies that's basically a multifaceted approach and in incorporating a multimodal, multi-mechanistic treatment plan. So multimodal is that non-pharmacological approach of your lifestyle modifications. Are they doing different things like postural corrections? Have they had uh, or went to physio? Not one patient will leave my office without a prescription for physio. Do we talk about different modalities such as cold, hot, uh, traction, these diff uh, things? And although the studies are not great, for the type of uh, modal treatments such as uh, acupuncture or chiropractic therapy. If a patient tells me that they found some benefit, I tell them, you know, go with it. But if there is no benefit, then I try to say, okay, let's not go there. Whereas your pharmacological approach, again, it's a multi-mechanistic treatment plan. And so the multi-mechanistic treatment plan comes from us not really understanding the mechanism of action of pain, and having very subjective information from our patients of how much pain reduction we're seeing. And this is where I talk about, or where I feel it's important to focus on those secondary outcomes and how functional the patient is. So first line, uh, you'll notice that is your gabapentinoids, basically your pre gabalin gabapentin. Second line, or uh, with that is your SNRIs, your duloxetines, or venoaphexine, or fexor, or your TCAs. Second line there, they jump into uh, uh, opioids, and I like to uh, uh, I lean towards the tramadol side rather than opioids, and then your other anti-epileptic medications, and then as you get into third line, you can see it gets a little more complex, and fourth line is where they start considering interesting things where it's not really understood, such as botulinum toxin. Next slide, please. And so nociceptive pain basically has the same approach, but, um, and I'm not sure if this is showing up, this is not a great slide, sorry, but the idea is they break it down into mild and moderate and moderate and severe. And basically with your mild and moderate, they tell you don't forget to add multimodal treatments such as topical. So you're still focusing on your optimizing of your multimodal treatment, topical medications, trying to treat the pain where it started but also pharmacological managements where we incorporate over-the-counter analgesics such as Tylenol, NSAIDs. And here we consider if they have uh, complications with regards to GI upset, blood pressure, you tend to lean away from your NSAIDs. But then if you look at that um, second to last or third to last box there, we're back at the drawing boards. You're back at the TCAs and you're back at the gabapentinoids and then you move on to your opioids and uh, therefore, uh, and thereafter, sorry. So next slides. So the Canadian Pain Society had come out with their own consensus statement. And this is what I usually use as guidelines for best practice when we're trying to treat pain. And any patient that will come in who is looking for different treatment plans, I always send back a letter to the family doctor making sure that, you know, have they been optimized on other treatments? And so as you can see, first line, we, we Gav, gabapentinoids, TCAs, and your SNRIs again. I, and what's different is you'll notice here we got tramadol opioids, but in Canada we got cannabinoids as third line, and then we go on to the fourth line treatments. Next slide. So just to jump back into GABA, the gabapentinoids in general and how I usually started in clinical context. And again, there is no real great evidence in how to um, dose these patients. You gotta remember they are renally dosed. So your geriatric patients, you gotta remember that you have to uh, renal uh, adjust the, depending on their kidney functions. But starting dose and because these, uh, these uh, 
medications, the way they function, it's it's very interesting. I, I like to start them off in the evening time with a, a, a very tiny dose. So from for gabapentin from 100 to, for example, 300 milligrams and see if they can tolerate that for about a week or so, so three days. And they say here, increase weekly uh, by 100 to 300 milligrams a day. And so if they can tolerate that, I usually put them on for at least a starting dose for at least a week. They're tolerating it well, then I'll start titrating. But depending on the patient and how aggressive you want to be, you can continue to uh, increase the dose. And max dose for gabapentin is around 3,600, whereas your pregabalin, it's 300 milligrams BID, so 600 uh, total for the day. And I usually uh, will talk a little bit about adverse effects, what they should be looking out for and make sure they're coming back in if they have or experience any of these uh, adverse effects like the drowsiness. And these are the most common. Uh, there are many, but the most common, in my opinion, is that drowsiness, dizziness. Uh, the peripheral edema, uh, in my uh, experience, has not been, uh, it's not a, a simple peripheral edema that's uh, length dependent, that is treated by a diuretic. And most of my women or female patients uh, will uh, eventually add 10 to 15, 20 pounds easy on these medications and will come off just because of the weight gain alone. But that's something to consider. And keep in mind. So, next slide, please. I was always interested to see if there was any comparison from head-to-head uh, -head comparison between gabapentin, pregabalin, and JAMA from Neurology. Uh, at the end of 2018, November 2018, came out with this study. Again, their numbers were really low. End of 20, they were looking at patients with uh, sciatica and seeing how effective both gabapentin versus pregabalin was in this randomized double-blinded double dummy crossover trial and what they did was they took 20 patients but what was interesting or what i looked at here is how they dosed their gabapentin from 400 to 800 milligrams pid where their uh, pregabalin they dosed at 150 to 300 milligrams uh, and to me, that, that, that's where they kind of uh, put together a comparison of what those doses would look like. In my mind, um, family doctors always ask me, how do you uh, dose adjust and change this uh, titrating wise? Again, they both work the exact same mechanism of action. The only difference is that pregabalin has a stronger affinity to those calcium channels, so we'll hang around longer so you can BID dose it. But again, it's max doses around 600, where your gabapentin is 3,600. And so if you take the analogy of the stereo and the volume on the stereo going up and down, some patients you want to aggressively increase their dose, and some patients you want to be a little judicious of how you want to increase their dose. So I think with that study, it wasn't uh, obviously, you can't really draw much conclusion between the two medications, but the key there was for me is the, the way they dosed it. You can go to the next slide. I won't talk too much about it because there wasn't that much information. Again, misuse. Um, there wasn't that many studies to talk about misuse, but uh, one of the bigger ones was the Smith and Group, where they looked basically at the populations at risk of addictions of gabapentinoids. Um, and they came out with a statement saying uh, patients with other current or past substance use disorder, mostly opioid, multi-drug users, uh, should basically, uh, they prefer pregabalin um, over gabapentin. And I think that's just because of the dosage in general, but uh, their statement was gabapentin, it should be used or avoided or even indispensable, administered with caution with uh, strict therapeutic prescription monitoring when using. But uh, again, uh, you have to take all these uh, studies with a grain of salt. Next slide, please. Uh, misuse, uh, like I was talking about, the, 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 the understanding behind the misuse is that these 
when you actually look at the four or five published studies when they looked at the misuse and how it is controlled substances in the UK and the, the US, what they did find is that most people who did come in with complications or overdose had concomitant opioid use. Um, it, it, it's mostly safe as compared to an opioid. You don't really get straightforward overdose with gabapentinoids but there is that uh, it has a potentiating effect of substances in general. So what you'll uh, notice from these studies is it does potentiate the use of, or the effect of alcohol and does potentiate the use of opioids. So the patients with substance use disorder are the ones who are looking to abuse it. But overall, uh, safety wise, we're not seeing that patients are overdosing on these medications. Next slide, please. Sorry, we're on the JAMA Neurology Misuse. Sorry, uh, we're on Misuse. Next slide. Yeah, and that's the end of the presentation. I just wanted to leave that again. Like I mentioned, pain is very complex. It's not simple, and it's very subjective which goes to show that the studies are not as simple and you always have to take these studies with a grain of salt when in real clinical practice. Next slide. References. Next slide. The rest of the references. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, both Colleen and Dr. Khalil, and for everybody hanging with us with our brief little technological interruption. So we do have a few questions, and I know we are running a bit short on time, but we'll try and cover as many as we can. Uh, first question was, uh, wondering any comments on evidence in terms of chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy? So, the interesting uh, thing with the peripheral neuropathies, and again, this goes to show that it's not really well understood, that gabapentin was able to get approval for um, diabetic peripheral neuropathy, but for HIV did not show efficacy or um, improved or pain intensity reduction, as well as HIV neuropathy. So there are studies to show that it is not efficacious for HIV neuropathy. And I think um, one of my slides may have included that information. Thank you, Dr. Khalil. Colleen, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, I haven't come across anything uh, from a catalyst perspective um, addressing that. So no, no comments right at this time. Oh, good, thank you. Uh, next question is, how long should uh, you continue gabapentin or pregabalin before switching if it's not seeming to make a difference? So again, no real strong studies, but uh, uh, British Columbia has a therapeutic journal that came out, I believe, this month in 2019 with a study. They were looking at all the different RCTs for pregabalin, gabapentin, and uh, efficacious use. From my, uh, from my experience, um, as I mentioned, with gabapentin max dose being 3,600, I used to get patients to around 2,200, 2,400, or near half dose, 18, so from 1,800 to 2,400. And if I wasn't use, uh, noticing benefit, I would just not call it quits, but potentially reduce, but not find any further purpose to increase or optimize that dose in gabapentin. The same with Lyrica, although uh, pregabalin is mentioned to a max dose of 600, I've rarely found it effective at uh, above 300. And so what this study from uh, uh, what that was published in the therapeutic journal in BC was basically showing that gabapentin above 1800 milligrams was no longer efficacious, which is kind of justifying because it was something I was using anecdotally, but uh, some evidence is now trickling in that there is no reason to optimize further. It's similar with uh, duloxetine. The 
I believe it, we, people were going up from 30 to 60 and continuing to titrate up. There's no evidence to show that it'll be a, more effective if a patient has not shown any pain intensity reduction. After the 60 milligrams, there's no further reason to increase your titrate. From my understanding is you got to go back to that neuroanatomy. If you're bombarding those receptors and that patient's mechanism of pain is not being reduced from this mechanism of action medication, then most likely that's not the pathway that the pain is taking. The invisible pathway in the neuroanatomy that we don't really understand, it's probably multiple lanes is how I explain to patients. It's like a highway and it's multiple lanes. And every patient is slightly different and sometimes you have to find the right lane to block to prevent some of that pain. I really like that analogy, Dr. Quill. Um, and kind of on those same lines, is there any evidence then to rotate or switch from pregabalin to gabapentin or vice versa? So uh, again, uh, I'm not aware of any evidence out there. But from my experience, there are patients who have responded to gabapentin and not to pregabalin and vice versa. But that study from JAMA, from JAMA Neurology, looked at uh, basically gabapentin or saying that gabapentin was more effective. But again, you can't really draw conclusions from ends of 20 where they're unable to reach statistical significance. You always have to take these pain studies with a grain of salt. They're very poorly powered. Okay. Another question that I see here, is client drug tolerance an issue with gabapentin and pregabalin? Sorry, uh, repeat the question. I'm sorry, it says, is client drug tolerance an issue with gabapentin and pregabalin? Tolerance, uh, such a, the way we see tolerance in opioid use and needing to increase the dose further. Um, I'm not sure if there's studies out there, but I do notice that there is tolerance and you tend to titrate because of patient tolerance. But for me, it's always that you want to ensure that you're not just looking at the visual analog scale and taking subjective information of pain intensity reduction but using also other medications. And if you're not find it, finding it efficacious, uh, it's unlikely that it's gonna continue to help. Okay, and recognizing being cognizant of time, probably just one last question will sneak in here. Uh, is there evidence or do you follow a test dose approach to give 100 milligrams initially to test for a patient's ability to tolerate the medication? Yeah, so with gabapentin, uh, as you notice, it is uh, dosed TID or QID, and this is why I like um, gabapentin, just because of that uh, wide range of the dose availability from 100 to 3600, and if you think of that stereo volume button analogy, you can always, like we're trying to turn down the volume. You're also, with titrating medication or optimizing your medication, it's like you're slowly increasing the volume or increasing that medication so you're not having as much side like side effects compared to that increase in dose so from my experience is the test dose of starting really low depending on the patient and their tolerance in general to other medications at 100 to 300 milligrams once a day just at night time see if they can tolerate it. And if they're waking up okay and not feeling too drowsy or dizzy, and they're able to tolerate that for at least a week, I usually increase the nighttime dose for at least a month before I start introducing morning doses. Perfect, thank you, Dr. Cleo. So that really brings us to the end of the hour. I want to thank everybody for joining us today and both to you, Colleen and Dr. Khalil for excellent presentations. Uh, if there's any further questions or anything that we were unable to address during this webinar or for any other requests, please don't hesitate uh, to send us an email or get in touch in other ways. Uh, easiest way in Saskatchewan is sksupport at cadeth.ca. 
And thank you, everybody, and enjoy the rest of your day.